Early November 2020, Chinese semiconductor maker Tsinghua Unigroup defaulted on $197 million, 1.3 billion RMB, of its bonds. China's credit rating agencies downgraded the company's credit rating. The potential for a downward credit spiral is very real. This company might not ring many bells. People might recognize the Tsinghua part of the name. It's the name of a famous university in Beijing. But not all that much else. Who cares about another company in China, even one with partial state backing, defaulting on its bonds? I'll talk more about the default later, but to me this company is interesting because of the buy-buy-buy acquisition strategy China pursued in semiconductor technology development for several years during the 2010s. It's also one of China's national champions. In this video, I want to talk about Unigroup, its rise to prominence, and its history of company acquisition. But first, let's talk a little bit about what I've been working on in the forthcoming email newsletter. I'm working on a new extension to the Hakka video that I posted many years ago. The Hakka people have a history that is very fascinating, but not all of it managed to fit in the single short video. The post allowed me the chance to add a bunch of new stuff after the fact, including stuff about clothing, history, and expanding on, for example, the Hakka Punti Wars. You can really look forward to that one. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. You can find the link to the newsletter in the video description below, or you can just go to asianometry.com. Subscribe and I'll try to make it worth your while. You can expect a newsletter every four days at 1 a.m. Taiwan time. Thanks. Tsinghua Unigroup bears the name of the prestigious Tsinghua University in Beijing. It was founded in 1988 as the school's corporate arm for commercializing its research. Tsinghua University is one of China's big prestigious universities. Many of its professors fled to Taiwan at the end of the Civil War where they established NTHU, National Tsinghua University, in Xinchu. Across the strait, the Communist Party rebooted Tsinghua University in 1952 with a focus on engineering and the sciences. Tsinghua, the mainland version, counts Xi Jinping, Hu Jintao, and other political leaders as its alumni. It has one Nobel Prize winner amongst its faculty. The company, is a digital infrastructure and services company. It operates as kind of a holding and intellectual property organization, owning companies like Unisplendor Corporation and Unigroup Guoxing. As of 2018, they employ over 40,000 employees. There are a few articles that imply that Unigroup is wholly owned by the university. That doesn't seem to be true. According to Chinese corporate filings, Unigroup is indeed majority owned by the university, but just 51%. The rest is owned by a Beijing investment company founded by Unigroup chairman Zhao Weiguo. Zhao is an interesting guy. Born in Xinjiang as an ethnic Han Chinese, he survived the Cultural Revolution and enrolled in Tsinghua University. He then moved to the university's corporate arm, Unigroup, rising in the ranks as one of Unigroup's subsidiaries. He then left to start a real estate investment firm, buying and selling Beijing properties. After making a lot of money there, earning his first bucket of gold, Dao fulfilled the dreams of office workers everywhere and used his money to buy a big share of his former employer. In interviews and public statements, he toes the party line. He talks about strengthening China's abilities in the semiconductor space and supports openness in the U.S.-China relationship. Last year, he urged American technology companies to help ease relations. On the one hand, they're earning lots of money here in China, and on the other hand, they're making malicious remarks about China to the U.S. government behind the scenes. U.S. companies can do better, especially technology giants. Some American companies do well, and some do not. He's probably referring to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook. The Zuck played up the China threat in his remarks to Congress, yet at the same time Facebook Inc. makes some $5 billion a year from advertisers in China trying to reach customers around the world. Anyway, that's, that's off topic. As you might guess, Dao's rags to riches journey is very interesting to me. So interesting that I wonder if there's more to it. The Nikkei Asian Times note that he used to be ex-colleagues with the son of former Chinese president and paramount leader Hu Jintao. In 2008, Hu Haifang served as party secretary of Tsinghua Holdings, Unigroup's parent company. And they worked together, I think, uh, prior to that. That might help. Tsinghua Unigroup's goal is to be the leading company in the production of integrated circuits and information technology. They want to help narrow the IC gap between Chinese and the West. This is a tough problem. 
in a crowded industry with a lot of well-funded competitors and very specialized knowledge, how do you catch up? How do you make your way from the back of the pack to the front? Taiwan and South Korea benefited from what we call technology transfer agreements. China has too in the past, trading access to their massive market with agreements to acquire advanced technologies. But it's harder to do this in the semiconductor space. Countries tend to be very protective of where their technologies are going. Unigroup's strategy appears to be two-pronged. The first is to pay up for large acquisitions of companies in the West. Once acquired, Unigroup drives R&D efforts to file international patents and reap the resulting patent revenue. Unigroup has filed for over 10,000 patents in the past decade, covering all parts of the integrated circuit industrial value chain. They're, I think they're using these acquisitions as sort of like an accelerated catch-up, so to skip the years of development, learning, what, whatever have you. And, you know, the interesting thing is that Unigroup actually started out as more of like a lab sciences company, just kind of like working with science experiments. Unigroup first entered the semiconductor space with the 2013 acquisition of China's largest fabless semiconductor company, Spreadtrum. After buying Spreadtrum, Unigroup added a second domestic purchase, RDA. I believe they then merged the two companies together and rebranded it as Unisoc. The two acquisitions cost the firm some $6 billion, but leapfrogged the company into being the third largest mobile phone baseband chip supplier in the world. Number one and two are Qualcomm and MediaTek. Okay, so you bought two fabulous companies. Does that really mean anything? In my previous video, I talked about the importance of validating your product in the world market, like through sales or foreign investment. Thus, Unigroup set out and received a 9 billion RMB investment from Intel, their proof of their global competitiveness. This perfectly positioned the company to receive funds from the 140 billion RMB National Integrated Circuit Industry Investment Fund, formed a year later in 2014. Excellent timing. They got 10 billion RMB from the fund and another 20 billion from the National Development Bank. Chinese foreign acquisitions had been on the rise during the 2013 to 2016 period, and Unigroup was single and ready to mingle for bigger buys abroad. They would attempt a number of foreign transactions in attempt to absorb foreign technology, leapfrog their progress, and advance China's semiconductor industry. The first in 2014 was when Unigroup spent $3 billion in a 51% majority stake takeover of Hewlett Packard's Chinese server storage and technology unit, H3C. The next year in July 2015, Unigroup attempted to acquire Micron Technology for $23 billion. Micron is the United States' largest memory chip company, making DRAM memory chips and data storage products. At the time, Micron's stock was down 50% and the industry was working through a memory glut. Had the transaction gone through, it would have been the biggest US purchase by a Chinese company ever. The problem is that large transactions by foreign companies need to be reviewed by an interagency committee for national security implications. This committee is called CFIS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. CFIS has the right to review and block any acquisition after review. It is the successor to a 1988 law, the Exxon Florio Amendment, which was passed in response to foreign acquisitions by Japanese companies. Micron had concerns about the bid from Tsinghua and turned it down before the talks ever got serious. Tsinghua Unigroup's association with the university, which is directly under the PRC's Ministry of Education, made it likely that CFIS would consider it a Chinese government-controlled company. Unigroup modified its strategy that same year in September 2015 with its second attempted acquisition. In this transaction, one of the company's subsidiaries, Unisplendor, released a cooperation statement with American storage maker Western Digital. In this transaction, Western Digital would issue to Unisplendor $3.77 billion of shares, a 15% stake in the company, and give it one board seat. Unigroup likely was hoping that the fact that the WD transaction was an equity purchase in addition to the fact that it was done through a subsidiary would allow it to evade CFIS rule. CFIS was like, nice try, and in February 2016, WD got a letter from CFIS telling them that the transaction would need to be reviewed. Unisplendor and WD called it off. The third big attempted acquisition came in November 2015 when Unigroup 
proposed in media actually a merger with Taiwanese fabulous company MediaTek. Zhao Weiguo told Taiwan Media that he wanted to merge his two companies, RDA and Spreadtrum, together the number three baseband chip makers, with MediaTek, the number two baseband chip maker. The combined company would be larger than Qualcomm, the number one maker. This merger proposal came in at the same time with the announcement of Tsinghua's acquisition of a 25% stake in PowerTech Technology, a provider of test and packaging services for the IC industry. This particular niche in the IC industry is open to mainland Chinese investment. MediaTek is a spin-off from UMC, Taiwan's first electronics foundry. Depending on how you measure things, it's the world's fourth largest IC designer ahead of names like AMD and Marvell. MediaTek is a Taiwanese national champion, second probably only to TSMC. The government declined to change the laws to allow the merger to happen. 2016 would see the last big Chinese foreign acquisition of the era, Medea's purchase of German robotics maker KUKA. The KUKA acquisition, though successful, got a lot of press and kicked off a new era of wariness surrounding big Chinese acquisitions. And then a year later, China clamped down on capital flight and the shopping spree came to an end. After these failed foreign acquisition attempts, Tsinghua Unigroup turned inward. Their failed investment in WD reflected their interest in breaking into the memory chip market. The market is currently dominated by a small coterie of American and Korean firms like Samsung, SK Hynix, and Micron. In July 2016, Tsinghua purchased a majority stake in Wuhan Xinxin Semiconductor and rolled it into a shell company it created called Changjiang Storage. Changjiang is in reference to the Changjiang River, more well known to Westerners as the Yangtze River. The company is based in Wuhan. Zhao vowed that he and his company would invest $100 billion over the next 10 years to turn Yangtze memory into a world-class domestic memory chip company. He brought in the former CEO of Japan's Elpida Memory to lead DRAM development at Yangtze. The government has strongly gotten behind Yangtze Memory, and in April 2018, President Xi Jinping visited the Wuhan factory, and he gave a speech there, in which he said that in order to achieve China's 200-year goals, some major core technologies must overcome difficulties on their own. Two years later, the company announced a major breakthrough in NAND flash memory, the company had kicked off then a pair of massive chip factories in Chengdu and Chongqing looking to replicate the success they've had in Wuhan. Right now though, those multi-billion dollar projects have stalled as Tsinghua Unigroup works through its debt issues. It appears that Unigroup's default has been long foretold. Earlier this year in 2020, the Chinese government passed down new economic reform rules that separated state-owned entities like universities from their commercial bodies. Once Tsinghua University was made unable to subsidize Tsinghua Unigroup, the latter began to struggle. The debt Unigroup has already defaulted on seems to be a small percentage of its overall debt profile. The company has another 157 billion RMB, 22 million USD roughly, of debt coming due in the next year, and many billions of RMB coming after that. The government has apparently decided to get more involved. Dow has stepped down from the boards of several companies in 2018. An additional executive chairman for the overall group was also recently appointed. Uh, Dow remains executive chairman of the overall group. Just like with Hongxing in Wuhan, many of Unigroup's projects rely on billions of dollars of funding to come from local governments. By themselves, Unigroup doesn't have enough money. But then, as high-profile failures like Hongxing filter through the system, governments start cracking down on projects, giving them a lot more scrutiny and looking to avoid something of the same happen to them. Not to say that Unigroup is another Hongxing. Unlike Hongxing, Unigroup actually owns part of a legit semiconductor business that is actually running and, you know, making money and all, and is a national champion. No reason that Unigroup can figure things out and eventually arise Phoenix-like as a new slimmed-down entity. Like I said, they still own some very interesting assets. But it's going to take some time for funding to come in. In the meanwhile, the company's projects sit mothballed. Alright everyone, take care of yourselves. It's a crazy world out there. Have a good one.